Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Is it possible to be moved by music, but not worship the Lord? Is it possible to think that you're doing okay with the Lord, but then be close to falling? Well, today we'll study Isaiah 29 and find out just what God has to say about these kinds of issues. Hello again, and I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church. And today we're turning to Isaiah 29, which picks up where we left off yesterday. Now, by way of quick review, so far we've been going through the book of Isaiah for the past about week and a half or so. As we've been going through it, we have been seeing several messages from God to his people regarding their sin and the consequences for it. We have seen that judgment is coming upon Israel and is ultimately coming upon all of the nations of the earth. But after this judgment, the Lord will establish a new kingdom ruled by our Lord Jesus Christ. And yesterday we learned that the announcement of that kingdom is going to be scoffed at by those who are not a part of it. Now, you might remember that yesterday's prophecy was specifically directed at the northern kingdom, which Isaiah calls Ephraim in Isaiah 28. He used that term and highlighted the northern kingdom's pride. Now, when the people of the south heard that woe, It's theoretically possible. They were like, yeah, well, we're good. We've got the temple. We've got the teachers. We've got the leaders. We've got wisdom. We're good. Nothing is going to happen to us. But chapter 29 starts out saying, basically, not so fast, folks. You're not immune to this coming judgment. And so if you look at verse 1, it begins with this word, woe. Woe to Ariel. Now, whenever a prophet begins saying the word woe, that's a bad sign. It's a pronouncement of God's judgment upon whoever he's talking to. And in this case, the person he's addressing is called Ariel. So who's Ariel? I mean, it sounds like a nice name, right? Might be a nice person. Well, Ariel is a nice name, at least a nice sound to it, but it doesn't have a nice meaning. The term Ariel literally means hearth of fire. And in today's terms, it might be better understood as a pit of fire. Now, your Bible might have a footnote that says it also means lion of God. And that's because the word Ari means lion and El means God. But every scholar I consulted with basically dismissed that understanding of how this word was formed. They're saying it's a sign of judgment. In fact, verse 7 makes it clear this is a sign of judgment. We're just going to see that judgment unfolding as we go through this chapter. In fact, although we're going to cover this more in just a minute, the second half of this chapter is pronouncing judgment upon false worship. And so the idea is that they've been doing all this false worship, you know, been making all these sacrifices to the Lord, but it's all been for false motives, for false reasons. And so this term Ariel here in verse one is basically saying, you've been burning up all of these animals in false worship. Let me tell you, Ariel, you who love your false worship, you're going to be burned up in the fires of my judgment. And so this is a serious term of judgment being brought upon the Southern kingdom. Well, let's go on to verse three. The Lord tells him in verse three, basically, I will camp around you and encircle you. I will lay siege works against you. I'll raise up battle towers against you. This is just a picture of the coming military onslaught. You'll be brought low in verse four. You will grovel in the dust. In verse five, your enemies will become like fine dust, not as like insignificant or vaporized, but dust as in as numerous as the particles of dust, just an abundance of it. Everywhere you are, they're going to be all over you. And then just in case they had any delusions about why these disasters were coming upon them, verse six lets them know this is from the hand of the Lord as punishment. They thought they were immune to God's judgment because of their false worship. They were not. And so in verse seven, a multitude of nations will wage war against them. It'll be like a bad dream. And then in verses nine to 11, it warns them that they will not be able to respond properly. They will delay, they will deny, they will stagger around in their drinking, and they'll be unable to see that the danger is coming upon them is from the Lord. And so just as God's judgment is coming upon the northern kingdom back in chapter 28, it's also coming on the southern kingdom in chapter 29. But it's going to be like a fog, and they won't be able to recognize what's happening to them. And then look what verse 10 through 11 says. It says, For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. He has shut your eyes and the prophets. He has covered your heads, the seers. The entire vision will be to you like the words of a sealed book, which when they give it to the one who is literate saying, please read this, he will say, I cannot, for it is sealed. You see, God is giving them this message here, but they're not going to understand it. In fact, God will even cause his word to be to their most learned men, the seers, the prophets, the guys who are supposed to know this. It's going to be a sealed book. They can't open it up. They can't read it. They can't understand it. In other words, even if they could read Isaiah's prophecies, they would not be given the spirit of illumination from the Holy Spirit to understand them. These people are spiritually blind and spiritually illiterate, and therefore God's message will make no sense to them. And then the Lord explains why in verse 13. Verse 13 says, Then the Lord said, 
Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Now let's pause and unpack what the Lord is saying here, because this is a critical point we need to understand. To draw near to God with words means to outwardly pretend to worship God with words that are not truly believed. This person might be using flowery words with that flowery affected tone, but it's to receive praise for themselves from the people and not for the people to be praising the Lord. To honor God with our lips means to say the right things, but not from a place of true love and worship. To have a heart that is far from God means to love pretty much all kinds of other things more than the Lord. To be following traditions learned by rote means to have memorized a bunch of stuff or just following a bunch of traditions, but not really knowing why they're there or what they mean or even believing it anyway. This is false worship, and the problem of false worship is throughout the Bible. You'll see this going back to Cain's false worship back in Genesis 4, or Korah's false worship in Numbers 16, or Simon Magus's false worship in Acts 8, all the way to the false worship at the end of times that's mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, when people will be still gathering in the name of the Lord, but they won't endure sound doctrine, and instead will just pursue teachers who teach them what they want to hear. False worship is always repugnant to the Lord. Psalm 81.15 talks about people who pretend obedience to the Lord and yet hate him. Ezekiel 33.32 talks about those who listen to songs sung beautifully and played well, but have no intent of actually living them out, paying attention, or practicing them. False worship is a huge problem back then. It's even a problem in our day and age as well. There can be false worship in a hard-hearted, dead Orthodox church. There could be false worship in a what would seem like a vibrant church. There could be false worship in just those who are just following traditions. There can be false worship in those who are following no traditions. False worship is a tendency and a temptation for even people today. And the cure for false worship is for us to live out our faith. The book of James explains that we live what we believe. In other words, how we live shows what we truly believe. And so when tribulation comes or when we face problems at home or when we face something like this whole coronavirus pandemic or persecution or something else, We live what we believe. And what we do in that moment, that's what we really believe. And so the clearest way to see what we really believe is to see how we act in the midst of adversity or when no one else is watching. That's what we believe. And if we find that there's a huge disconnect between what we say publicly and how we live privately, the book of James would explain to us that's where our faith is dead and worthless. It was certainly dead and worthless in 700 BC. This whole culture prided themselves in their wisdom, discernment, their religion, But here we see it's all false. And so in verse 14 going on, that wisdom, that discernment, that'll be gone. Verse 15 pronounces another woe upon them for their deep plans that they don't submit to the Lord. This is the same heart of false worship, just coming at it from a different angle. When we are truly following the Lord, when we recognize he is true, real, he's actually involved in our life, we'll submit to him. We'll be like, Lord, what do you want me to do? We'll be taking our plans and laying them before him saying, Lord, you guide, you lead. But there are countless people who pretty much do whatever they want. They don't check with the Lord. They pretty much are going to do what they're going to do. They will ask him to bless their plans, but they're not submitting to him and surrendering their plans to him. And just like God's true people engage in true worship, God's people also wait for him and follow him and obey him and submit everything they do to him. Well, going on in this list of judgments here, verse 16 goes on to say, there were even some people who were so bold as to deny God as their creator. I mean, they're basically like, God didn't make us. God didn't make, no, he didn't make us. This is just epidemic in our world today. It's becoming commonplace to attribute our existence to pretty much anything else besides the handiwork of a true and living and personal God. And so this is going on in their day. It's going on in our day. And all of this is why God brings the fires of his judgment upon the Southern kingdom. They did not seek to know God's truth. They were engaging in false worship. They were not actually following God, but just doing what they wanted. And so God's judgment was coming upon them in the South and in the North. But then verse 17 brings a whole change to the tone. The Lord promises a revival, a restoration to his people. And so in verse 18, it says, on that day, remember, we've been talking about that day for the last few days now. On that day, those who are blind will be able to see. Those who are deaf will hear the book. You just see this working out in Jesus's ministry, but even in the ministry, every time someone comes to Christ today, I remember my own life. Before I came to Christ, I'd read the Bible, but I wasn't submitted to Christ. The words made no sense. But once I came to Christ and submitted myself to him as my Lord, suddenly the word of God became alive. And so you just see that here in verse 18. Going on, verse 19, they will rejoice in God, even though they're in affliction. The end of verse 20 says that those who are intent of doing evil, they'll be cut off. 
Verse 21 describes what these people who are intent on doing evil actually are doing. For one thing, they try to corrupt justice. And they also, and I and just find it interesting how it says it here, they also try to tie up the righteous people with meaningless arguments. I just find it amazing how often God's word condemns pointless arguments and wrangling over words. Here we're seeing that godly people are not quick to get ensnared in pointless debates with people who are only looking to air their own opinions rather than having a true, honest dialogue. Well, rather than this, in that day, verses 23 and 24 says, God's people will see his work among his people. They will stand in awe of him. And those who are wrong will know the truth and they will accept instruction. So there's going to be this revival here, this restoration here. And so chapter 29 is another one of these chapters that begins with judgment but ends with restoration. It opens with Jerusalem becoming a fiery wasteland of death. It ends with it turning to a fertile field of life. And it gives us a glimmer of what this restoration will look like. It will have true and sincere worship that replaces hard-hearted traditions learned by rote. It will have words of peace that will replace words of discord. Those who are afflicted will find healing. Those who are deaf will hear. Those who are blind will see. People will rejoice in the Lord, and they will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Now, no doubt these promises were begun to be fulfilled with Jesus' first coming. They will be fully fulfilled in the second coming. And so as we wrap up our study in this chapter, Let's just think about the characteristics of this restoration. And, and are these working out in our own life? This chapter talks about people who are under God's judgment, but they don't even know it. They're in a fog and cannot see God's hand behind what's happening to them. This can still be a danger, which is why we need to have a spiritual alertness to be aware of what's going on in our life and to be sure that we're always looking at our life through the lens of Scripture, just making sure that we're always walking the Lord in true, faithful obedience to Him. Likewise, this chapter shows us the danger of false worship. We need to be on guard anytime we engage in worship that's not truly from our hearts. You know, like when we're just standing there at church and just mouthing the words and not really thinking about what we're singing, uh, that can be false worship. A true worship breaks down tradition learned by rote. It replaces it with a living, vibrant worship that's just born out of love and devotion to the Lord. True worship replaces meaningless songs with those that are sung from the heart. True worship brings peacefulness to the heart and words of a person who is just used to bring discord. Now they're people of peace. And finally, as we just think about this chapter here, we're just seeing again, we live what we believe. And so let's just take a moment. What does our life reflect about what we truly believe? When we face adversity, when we face difficulty, what is it showing us we really believe about these things? If you find that your life reflects a weakness of your faith, and that's something we're all going to find as we examine our heart honestly, just bring that to the Lord. Let His grace strengthen you to know His truth, to believe it, and to live it, that your faith may grow and deepen and strengthen as you walk with your Lord. Well, we'll leave things there. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.